How's it going folks? Brian Cusco here at Triple B. Today we've got Dr. Andrea Fidget for you coming from another Herpeton talk talking to you about the importance of carotenoids in the diet of amphibians. And for those of you that don't know what carotenoids are, they're basically the color pigmentation that comes from natural sources of like plants and algae and stuff like that that cause yellow, orange, and red pigments. Those are carotenoids, just, just so you know. You're watching Triple B TV. Um, just a little bit of context, um, since um, I don't think I know many people in the room, so in all likelihood you won't know me. Um, but my uh, career was, uh, I'm going to call them non-native wild animals, um, uh, started way back in my uh, local zoo, which was in Glasgow in Scotland, if you're trying to place the accent. Um, and uh, that was working with American black bears uh, in 1989. Um, so I was a, a volunteer keeper, uh, very much drawn to working with carnivores and studying animal behavior at that point. My degree was, at the time, I was studying zoology. Um, I had the opportunity to work in Edinburgh Zoo as a keeper, this time working with birds. Um, and learned a tremendous amount from people who, for whom, very much like this community, most of the people that I was working alongside had kept birds um, since they were we, you know, so they'd kind of come through as enthusiasts and then ended up working with the species that they cared for. Um, and I've had a healthy respect for that um, stockmanship and knowledge uh, throughout my career. I then went to Jersey Zoo, and that's really where my switch from studying animal behavior and behavioral ecology moved to nutrition. And I was asked to study the nutrition of an endangered species, which was in captivity. It was the only population outside of its, um, its location. Um, and yet we knew very little about its nutrition, and it was a, a species of bird, a species of pirate, in fact. And that was in 92, and I've been kind of working with nutrition ever since then. Um, continuing my work in UK zoos, I was for 15 years at the Chester Zoo, um, and through that time period started to become very specialist in working with particular taxa. Now, something you might not know is that in the US, I think we have about 300 members of AZA. There was a discussion about AZA just prior to lunch. Um, I'm going to say maybe 20 to 30 of those members actually have master's level qualified nutritionists on staff. 10%, maybe a little more. So, at San Diego Zoo Global, we're lucky because we do have um, uh, several staff um, who are uh, ac more academically qualified. In case you're wondering what happens at other zoos, it's usually uh, the veterinary staff who are delegated, and obviously there's a huge amount of knowledge in, in our keepers and curatorial staff. Um, but nutrition is never the sexy subject at veterinary medicine. Uh, so um, there is there is some wonderful experts out there, but um, it, it, it is a specialism in and of itself. Now, the other caveat I have to give you here is um, Alan and I spoke about me presenting this three weeks ago, um, and it's what I'm going to talk to you about is some research that I did um, in the UK, and I oversaw that. So I'm going to kind of weave the history of how we came to be working with carotenoids and some of the work that we did. I'm sorry to have missed one of the presentations yesterday about uh, the Phylomedusae uh, frogs, because that that is a, a species that we'll be talking about uh, today. Um, but my, some of my recollection of the details of that research um, it will not be maybe as specific as I would like uh, for this audience. Uh, by all means, come and pester me afterwards. Uh, but most of what we have is published, and you would at least be able to read the abstracts for free online. I'll, I'll be putting those up later. Um, and that's, I'm going to blame the culture shift of moving from the UK to the US and even just driving on the other side of the road. These things all take different brain rewiring and my brain isn't as good with some of the details from a little while back. But with all that said, here's why we should care um, about studying um, 
carotenoids and thinking about it. This is a very charismatic species, uh, Agalitnus calidrius, the red-eyed tree frog, which um, was all over uh, the media as soon as we got high DTVs. It seemed to be the species anybody would focus on for high DTVs, uh, HDTVs, I should say. Um, but the issue is that um, they can fade on diets that don't contain carotenoids. This is a study that I'm going to describe in a little bit more detail later, um, but these are animals that were kept on diets that were nutritionally adequate, and the only thing that distinguished them was one had access to carotenoids and the other did not. So just before we kind of really get into some of that research, I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the role of amphibian conservation in zoos, because I think the reason why we were able to do some of the research that I'm presenting was because we just kind of came at it at the right time. I'm a great believer in serendipity. Um, so I happened to do a, a presentation for the University of Manchester. Chester is sort of um, about 40 miles um, west of Manchester. Um, and the University of Manchester has the like, largest biology faculty in Europe and I was asked to do a presentation about my job and I actually somebody else was doing this one of our earlier speakers was talking about um, different animals as food items um, and when we were listening to the talk about children's pythons earlier we we're talking about utilizing all the frogs that were around as foods parcels of foods so um, I was talking about that in the context of some stork nutrition work I did. There's a particular species of stork which, when it's breeding, um, switches its feeding habits to finding frogs for its youngsters. And I hypothesized that why it's doing that is because frogs are little bags of protein and calcium, um, which is, if you keep frogs, you probably don't like them described that way, and, and I've come to love frogs. but. Um, but on the basis of that, somebody came up to me afterwards and said, you talked about frogs as fruit, but would you like to do some research with them? Because we've got this um, work that we want to do. That was in 2007. And meanwhile, um, a bigger movement was forming um, within the zoological community and the wider conservation community, uh, which was uh, in 2008, which was uh, the formation of the amphibian arc in Year of the Frog. Um, and so it so happened that my zoo director at the time, uh, that's the gentleman on the right, uh, Dr. Gregor, uh, Gordon McGregor Reed, um, was the president of that association. And so he was really interested in research that we were going to do. And this is uh, located at Chester Zoo in one of the shipping containers that were being uh, called amphibian pods or apods, if you will, which were biosecure units. Um, and um, uh, you could keep an entire species in here and have them all linked and have showers and, 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 and maintain your biosecurity. And of course, the reason why we're thinking about biosecurity is because of the chytrid fungus. And so all of this was kind of timely. We were really interested in, in trying to understand a little bit more because zoos were being asked to become these um, arcs for species um, uh, to build survival assurance populations. The issue there, though, is that we understood so little about many of the species that we were bringing in. And, and it's been alluded to uh, in several presentations earlier today. Um, we're making these vast generalizations about species, not only in terms of diet, although that will be my focus, but things like their reproductive needs um, and maybe some of the, the diseases or aside from chytrid, some of the other um, health issues that they may face. And there is a distinct lack of empirical data. Now I am one of those pesky researchers that some folks may uh, find a little tedious, but the data really does help. As I said, I'm a great believer in stockmanship, but what I always want to try and do is take that knowledge and that understanding of why something works and quantify it and qualify it and then make it reproducible somewhere else. So when it comes to amphibian nutrition, um, then um, we really know very little. Um, and I love this picture because it's kind of who's eating, who, who's getting the upper hand. I like to think it's the frog. Um, but I'm sure there's, 
there's maybe, given this audience, there's probably some folks rooting for the snake. Um, but I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. What I would like you to do, um, though, when we talk about nutrition, and this is something that um, we all eat. In fact, we just ate. So my challenge now, given that we've just had some very yummy foods and we're in a darkened room, is making sure although I'm not sure I'm going to succeed, that you don't fall asleep. Because that's kind of our bodies are just, you know, the energy is going towards digestion right now rather than kind of keeping your focus up here. Um, but what we all do, because we all have to eat, is we all um, have this assumption that we kind of know a little bit about nutrition. And I'm not denying that there will be people in the room who have a great deal of knowledge. But if we just take our lunch... In fact, it's San Diego, so let's think. I want you all to close your eyes for a minute, which is a bit dodgy because it is dark. You just had lunch. You're going to fall asleep. Trust me. <laughs> I want you to picture, because we're in San Diego, picture your perfect taco. You fast forward to Tuesday. It's going to be Taco Tuesday, and you can imagine a taco. OK, everybody can do that. Nod your heads. That's a funny thing to watch, thank you. Um, OK, you can open your eyes now. Um, if I was to ask you, how many, name one ingredient in a taco, I'm pretty confident that everybody could do that. Two ingredients, three ingredients, you've probably put together an entire recipe in your head. If I was now to say to you, OK, that complete taco, could you tell me the protein content of it? Thank you for audience participation there. Already we have a no. Um, calcium. Vitamin A content. Carotenoid content. Probably not. Here's the thing. We all, all of, all of us in this room and all of the animals that we look after, they eat ingredients, but our bodies, their bodies, are using nutrients to grow, protect themselves from disease, and to reproduce. And it's that conversion of ingredients to nutrients, which is really the science of nutrition. Um, so I'm always sitting thinking when we were hearing about the, the pythons that are feeding on bats, I'm mentally translating a bat into its nutritional profile. Not that I know, but I can make an informed guess that it's going to be it's going to be a less watery bag of protein and uh, minerals than, than a frog, but it's not going to have a lot of fat. Um, so I'm already doing that translation in my head. Does that make sense? OK. So when we think about nutrition, and in fact, it doesn't have to be amphibian nutrition. You could substitute anything here. What you're thinking about is nutrition uh, for normal growth and development. That's our goal. Health and low mortality rate and successful reproduction, and that's production of fit and healthy offspring. That's the goal uh, in captive situations, whether it's for your own hobby, um, uh, for your business, or uh, for captive breeding. Um, and I think this is really uh, something we can all agree on. We definitely need more research to determine species-specific requirements because, and I think this number is actually out of date, the number is probably higher um, than this, but we have thousands of species of amphibians and we wouldn't talk about a mammal diet and expect that to cover everything from a tiger to the pygmy hippo um, to the, um, uh, uh, to the um, I said a tiger, a pygmy hippo, a giraffe. It, it just doesn't add up. So um, I think there's, I'm going to talk very uh, specifically about a group of frogs, but I started my career as a zoologist. I started studying biology and zoology that way. Um, so I do think taxonomically it's the only way to make the, the job manageable. With all the species that we care for, there's definitely job security. Um, but I liken what I do um, to having knowledge that's a little like topsoil. It's kind of thin and spread across lots of different species and lots of different nutrients. And every so often, I get the joy of being able to pair a, a, a taxon or a group of species with a particular uh, interaction. I'm not really going to talk about the other two uh, classes of amphibians today, um, but I do think that there are one, whatever we say today could be applied to other areas. Um, 
So this is, these are very familiar animals, um, but we actually know very little about their natural history. It, um, what we know comes largely from people like yourself, especially going back um, through the decades. All these anecdotal reports based on people just going out and, and, and herping um, is really how we know what we know. And we also have um, a huge variety of, uh, of strategies um, from completely aquatic to uh, aqu starting out as aquatic and then moving into a terrestrial life mode. Um, even when we think about tadpoles, um, which so most adult frogs are going to be what I would consider to be carnivorous. Um, uh, feeding largely on animal protein as a, as a feeding strategy. As, as tadpoles, they're going to have lots of different strategies. And they actually have lots of different mouse parts that are specialized. So you, when you're thinking about nutrition, I talked about the nutrient part, the chemistry part, but we also have to think about behavior. And we absolutely have to think about the anatomy. Um, and so there's all these other different strategies that go on. And even when we think about um, having acquired the food and it coming in through the mouth, it's then going into different digestive tracts. Really the bottom line here is that they have a very simple digestive tract. They're not going to be very specialized, not like the, the sort of mammalian herbivores who have lots of ways of making the most of the plant material that they consume. An adult digestive anatomy is pretty similar too. It's going to be a simple tube. So food is being ingested, it's going into the stomach, it's going through the digestive tract, and then any waste material that's not metabolized is going to be excreted. These pictures come from a great book uh, by Stevenson Hume. Um, and the pictures actually should be available online uh, through um, the Comparative Nutrition Society. So there's a whole range. There will be some fish and some reptile pictures up there as well if you're, uh, if you're so inclined to go looking. But they're great and they're all drawn to scale. And then we further compound our lack of knowledge by knowing that even if we know what animals eat, uh, we still don't have a huge amount of information about um, those wild prey and we most definitely even if we can come up with a shopping list as I like to call it of the things that they would choose to eat um, we definitely don't know that nutrition composition and it's going to vary and I'll mention a little bit more about that shortly um, and then where we do know information, it comes from stomach contents. Um, that, to me at least in my reading, perhaps, um, perhaps you can advise me differently, um, but it's largely opportunistic um, and problematic because animals sometimes don't eat when they're at different stages in their life, like when they're trying to find a mate. Their, uh, their attention tends to be focused on other things. So, uh, so you may not get a, a very accurate representation of their diets. And then, I mean, I, I just put these pictures in because they're kind of fun, um, but really there's just so little known. Um, and uh, there are, if you go looking online, as I am prone to do, for pictures of animals eating strange things that they maybe should or shouldn't, you can find lots of different examples. Um, so I think this is a bird on the left and then another frog, and I'm pretty sure it isn't photoshopped, but perhaps there's somebody who could tell me differently. But I already alluded to this. Um, we've got even less information on prey nutrient composition. Um, but what we can infer, because it's true in so many other situations, um, is that the wild prey type, just like the wild plant type, um, will be nutritionally superior to anything that we can mass produce. Um, with the greatest of respect to the, to the companies who are here um, and talking about food items, I think we just really have across the board, this isn't targeting uh, food types for reptiles, it's just across the board. We do have a very limited um, sort of zoo food supermarket 
for me, um, the limitations of artificially reared prey, um, which will be familiar to all of you, are that there's a mineral imbalance inherent in most of the items that we can offer. They tend to have low vitamin levels as well. Um, and carotenoids was a big question mark. We didn't know anything about them when we were starting out. Bearing in mind this was sort of around 2006, 2007. The, the, um, the industry and the, the knowledge has come on, come on tremendously. But really, our, I just pick, picked a couple of pictures. Um, we do, we're working with a very limited prey set. When we compare this against the literally millions of um, invertebrates that uh, our um, frogs and, uh, have access to, um, and remember also the, the composition. I'm looking at this and depending on the life stage, um, this animal and this animal is going to be a very fibrous uh, because there's a lot of exoskeleton. This may have um, more fat in it. Um, so there's, depending on the life stage of the insect, you're looking at different nutrient compositions. But notice uh, very deliberately they're all on green leaf material, which will naturally be high in uh, calcium in relation to phosphorus, and also be a source of uh, tocopherols, which are the precursors for vitamin E. Um, and depending on some of the other items, they'll also be a source of carotenoids. So by feeding on, this is what I mean about wild invertebrates being nutritionally superior to most mass-produced uh, invertebrates that are not then gut-loaded. And we're going to talk about that a little bit better. So I think it's just, it should be becoming obvious that it's kind of hard to formulate captive diets based on existing fieldwork data because it just isn't there. Um, and really, one of the most objective ways that we can get a better handle on this is to look at multi-generational breeding. So not just one instance, but when you can do this several times, and those offspring then go on and are productive. Um, and I will stress this often, um, it is the message that I want you to go away with. I'm not coming up with kind of a one-size-fits-all model, quite the opposite. Uh, we will likely need very many models for different uh, requirements. Um, and we have very limited uh, diet sources in captivity. And then I, there are people better qualified to talk about this uh, in the audience, but um, there are lots of ways in which health can be linked to diet, and I'm not going to go into them, except that we started to look at colour fading and dulling. Um, the research that we did was mostly looking at carotenoids, but we also uh, went on as a group to look at different sources of calcium. I'm not going to talk about that today. And we also looked at the provision of ultraviolet light because there was different schools of thoughts about how that should be provided, whether it should be an intense, sharp burst for a short period of time or a lower dose of UV, but still adequate, um, providing lots of different basking opportunities um, for a longer period of time. And again, I can direct you to that research because it's available um, if you would like to uh, read more, but I'm not going to talk about it today. So this is the work that we uh, did. Um, I do want to acknowledge the co-authors here because it's Vicky Ogilvie's PhD. Um, I was working with Doug Sheriff, who was somebody I'd known as a keeper at Edinburgh Zoo and then Chester Zoo. Um, and then uh, my colleague uh, Richard Preziosi at the University of Manchester. And we were really wanting to look at the effect of diet and environment on the development and fitness of uh, tropical frogs uh, in our care, and then also try and determine optimum management conditions for reproduction. And here we go, we're back to this uh, picture of the frogs on carotenoids. And, and this was the, the story that had been presented to us. These were animals that were being um, found in captivity after successive generations. It actually started with a study, we're mostly using Agalichnus species here, uh, Calodryas, and then we move on to use, uh, to work with Morletti. Um, but in fact, the person that we started to work with, who um, we later, um, we just went different paths, but we were actually going to work with the splendid leaf frog, the Cruciohyla calcifera. 
Um, but uh, in, in the end, the red eye tree frog proved uh, just an easier model. Um, and we were looking at what is the best frog diet in terms of color. And then in situ in Belize, um, does that color matter? Um, so Alan mentioned this. Um, he's got a passion for carotenoids. And actually, before I met Alan, and I didn't put it together, um, the team in Chester were saying, there's this product we really want to get um, and we really want to use. It's called Super Pig, um, and it's by Rapashi. And it was being sold, and I was going, hmm, I wonder what this is. And then I meet Alan, and I don't even pay attention to his badge. And I'm going, oh, it's you. OK, great. Um, but carotenoids are, um, it's actually a really huge group. Just like I said, there's, you know, amphibians are a really huge group. Carotenoids is this umbrella term used to describe about 750 naturally occurring uh, compounds that are pigments, they're fat soluble. Um, they are responsible for yellow, orange and red coloration. They are for all animals that use carotenoids in color and not all coloration comes from carotenoids, but when it does, it has to come from the diet. So you probably know that without uh, coloration in flamingo foods in captivity, flamingos would be white. Um, so that's one thing that we know and we add carotenoids to flamingo food. Um, the curious thing is, because I've worked with a number of different species now, is we only make one type of flamingo food because their nutrient requirements are pretty much similar. From the smaller to the, from the lesser to the greater, from the Carib Caribbean to the Chilean, their, their nutrient requirements are similar. They don't deposit carotenoids equally. So you will get species who are very pigmented like this throughout, and you'll, you'll also get the ones which have a paler head, paler bodies and then pink tips or pink knees, uh, pink feet, the carotenoids are distributed in different places. So something is going on even at a species level, even when we feed the same product to different species. So that's, and there's only seven species of flamingos. Um, but really why they're kind of interesting beyond color is um, partly because they're believed to function chemically as antioxidants. And what that means is that they're going out and helping. Um, we have free radicals going around our body, which is a good thing uh, because they, uh, they attack pathogens. But when, that, um, when free radicals are in excess, they'll start to uh, attack our own cells. And so we need some antioxidants in our system to create that balance. So what? And so they function to help support our immune system. And that's why coloration is believed to be an honest signal of your health. Not your health, um, but health of an animal. So when you're very brightly colored, yes, you might be, um, in the case of some of these amphibians, um, advertising that you're not good to eat. Um, but in the more general sense, color is thought to be a signal of, hey, I'm really sexy. I'm very healthy as well, and you should meet with me. OK. so. We know that carotenoids are responsible for the yellow-red coloration in some species. And we also know that the, the fact that they have this bimodal life history where they go from being an aquatic tadpole um, that will have ha come out of an egg, also in water or in some kind of medium, um, and then go through a period of, in fact, quite high oxidative stress. So that metamorphosis um, uh, phase where they're pushing out limbs and, and, and changing into an adult frog is usually quite fast uh, to avoid predation. But there's a, it could be quite stressful physiologically as well. So those carotenoids could be beneficial even at a larval stage, even when they're not colored. Um, so we were just trying to understand a little bit more about that. I've already talked about this, so I'm not going to dwell on it, other than we know as well that in so many other zoo species, we can come up with a, a, a diet that kind of comes in a pellet form. That doesn't tend to work with frogs, because particularly as adults, they're going to want to eat prey that actually moves. 
So what we were trying to do, because we were interested in crickets, was we wanted to understand whether all cricket species are equal. This isn't some deep philosophical question, it's just looking at them as vehicles for uh, delivering other nutrients. Um, and then all the different diets that were out there, and there's a great literature on this if you're really interested in reading more. Um, we just picked a couple of things that we were interested in. Um, and we were working with a couple of different cricket species, and the reason for this is because um, the banded cricket and the black cricket are the crickets more commonly available in the UK and, and to a certain extent in Europe. Most of the literature, however, that had preceded us was looking at the nutritional composition of the house cricket. Is that, just asking the audience, is that the cricket species that you would mostly get? Bandage. Bandage. You would get bandage now? And nice and black. Okay. Um, so most of the literature I could find, at least around 2005 and before, was using the, the house cricket. So those were our three study species. Um, and they don't all grow the same. I have to say that because we had our own breeding colony and um, black crickets were a little choosy, um, but still, we, we, we figured it out. They, they definitely had different uh, preferences for humidity and temperature. Um, but what we were doing was also using different diets. So we were using a fish flake. Um, you would know, I think there's, there's a brand called Aquarium, but there's some others. Um, but effectively, they all do the same thing, and some of them are also brightly colored because they're going into fish that would use carotenoids. Um, we were looking at just a wheat bran diet, which tends to be how some suppliers would provide uh, uh, animals to you. And then we were looking at what happened if you added just vegetables as a source of carotenoids. And what we wanted to know was we had so three species of crickets, three diets. But then once an insect goes into a vivarium, you will all know that your animal might not just eat right away. So full gut is that freshly gut-loaded animal going into the vivarium. Two days later is what might have happened after that insect still wandering around, waiting to be eaten, and it's effectively defecated out its contents, its stomach contents. It's still surviving, but it's no longer what we would call sort of a premium uh, gut-loaded product. So those were our categories. And then what I'm going to show you here is we only look, just looking at one category. Uh, so that's the fish food diet here. So the darker, the coloured version is full, uh, full stomach, um, and this is empty gut. So full gut, empty gut, and we're looking at total carotenoids. And so what you can see is that the domestica, which is green, and the um, the sigillatus, which is the banded cricket. Um, there isn't a huge amount of difference, but there's definitely everything loses carotenoids because um, what we're looking at is total carotenoid concentration. Everything loses after two days. So those carotenoids are definitely not in the system any other way. They've been in the gut and they've come out. Um, but what was curious, and this was repeated over multiple times, that had to be for publication. But we definitely saw higher uh, concentrations of carotenoids in our black cricket. We then broke that down and started to look at the different carotenoid concentrations. And again, this is not something I have the data for uh, to, to explain. I think the orange is uh, beta carotene. Um, but beyond that, I won't be able to break down the detail, but it will be in the paper. Um, but basically, you can see there's no, we looked at the total carotenoids in the diet itself, nothing in bran, not surprisingly. Here's what we have in the fish food. Uh, on a concentration basis, and here's what we had in the vegetables. The vegetables were red pepper and carrot, um, so the right colours to contain carotenoids. Um, and here's what happens in those diets afterwards in this um, uh, the other species here. So we're seeing that the concentration of um, carotenoids is higher in our bimaculatus, the, the black cricket, than in the bandied cricket. Uh, so you're seeing that we're coming up with lower numbers um, and that there's a significant difference. So not surprisingly, wheat brown diet on its own, no source of carotenoids in there, so it's not going to be a great um, source for the insects. But even we're getting just a different composition. 
So what we concluded um, was that, curious, we didn't expect this result. We really went in just, this was a precursor to doing some of the, the more detailed work. Let's just check that all our food sources are the same. And hey, presto, we figured, that, well, they're not. And that uh, in our trials, at least, uh, that we found that the black cricket was a better vehicle uh, for holding on to. Um, carotenoids and the, uh, a fresh fruit and vegetable diet offered to the crickets was uh, the better uh, means of getting carotenoids into them. So now we move to Belize um, and this is the study site that Vicky uh, went to to collect some data on wild animals and here we were trying to understand whether coloration was important um, and so this Vicky collecting animals um, there's some uh, naughty pictures coming up because she's not wearing gloves and she should have been and I know that um, most of the other pictures would have depicted that um, but what she's doing here is we've got frogs and amplexus and so we we're collecting frogs that were already mating and then scoring their coloration um, and so she managed to collect data on 80 frogs she was looking at morphometrics um, and also looking at colour. And they had a portable uh, spectrophotometer, and, uh, but she was also taking photographs. And what we were using, um, it's not visible in this slide here, but we were actually using um, a, a colour fan as a standard. And the colour fan comes from Roche. And there are two colour fans that you can get from them because they produce the carotenoids that are used by the fish industry for salmon farming and also for the poultry industry because you can add colour to make your egg yolks oranger because people perceive that oranger egg yolks are healthier. Um, and they may well be, um, but there is that perception. Um, so that was one of the colour standards. So what we were measuring here was uh, leg and flank. Um, and what you can see is that there's some sexual dimorphism in terms of colour, or sexual dichromatism, I should say. Um, so the males are here, and the leg and flank you can see. So males are generally redder than the females. Um, and um, also, the males, at least in the small study that we did with those 80 animals, the successful males, the ones that were amplexant, were also redder than all of the other males in the study. So there was a, a, a shift that the ones who were at least um, having successful matings uh, were, or being able to mate successfully with a female were redder. And this shows male leg color here, female leg color here. There seemed to be some kind of sorting. So what you would see is this where um, if you plot the two together, we're starting to see some aggregations. So females were picking males that were um, the same color as them. And we would call that assortative mating. So it seemed to suggest that redness was benefiting you. So it kind of does matter if you're dull because you're not getting those breeding successes. I will also say that we wanted one of the outcomes of going here was also to collect um, some information about stomach contents so that um, we could get some wild data or data from the wild about carotenoid content. Um, nearly all the males that were sampled don't think we had, um, I think this mostly applies to males, most of the males had no stomach content. They were just so busy focused on uh, singing and attracting mates that over the course of um, uh, an extended uh, period of time, they must have been eating. I can't believe that they could have been surviving uh, the weeks that um, Vicky was there, but really their stomach contents were for the most part empty when they were being collected. Um, I'm just going to move on now to the, the extension of this, which was, so we had done a great deal of work with uh, Vicky um, and the populations that she had made, established at um, Manchester, then uh, took shape and we started to use it with the second PhD funded by a different research council, but still with Manchester. And this was Rachel Antwes, who's done a considerable amount of work. And she really introduced us to the idea of uh, the cutaneous microbial communities living on the skin of amphibians. 
and our speaker earlier on who was talking about bioactive environments and, and substrates. Um, I was really here, pleased to hear about that and, and her call for more research at the end because I think that is going to be quite key. Something that we were trying to do in uh, Rachel's work was try and look at, in addition to the, the, just the basics of what would a food look like and, and, and does it matter if you're, uh, do we see evidence of frogs using colour in the wild? We wanted to then to say, okay, if we apply this in a captive setting, what are the measures of health and fitness that are going to make sense to us? So really we wanted to look at uh, morbidity, we wanted to look at growth, and we wanted to look at reproductive output, given that we're bringing species in specifically to be assurance populations. Can we also measure colour and cutaneous bacterial communities? And so what we're talking about there is really looking at the fact that um, there are um, this whole uh, area of microbiome research um, and we've got a centre for microbiome innovation in uh, San Diego um, at UCSD. It's really becoming uh, incredibly important. We're starting to understand more and more how the microbes who live on and in us control many areas program, many areas of health and uh, disease function. Um, so you can imagine that those things that are living on an amphibian skin, uh, given that they're also using their skin to breathe and, and, and uh, they are so susceptible to environmental um, uh, pathogens, means that this is quite an important area of research. And so um, there's knowledge that basically there's all these potentially lethal pathogens out there. Then there's the things that are living on the skin, which may protect from pathogens, uh, but how they propagate on your skin will be determined by the environment that you're in and what you eat. Um, and some of those things might be beneficial um, and help because they basically competitively exclude the, the nasties. Um, uh, but some of those things, if they are not in balance, will mean that you become more, you have an altered microenvironment, you have an altered bacterial state, and you're more susceptible to the pathogens. So it's a really complex picture. Um, and um, it's really important to know what's going on and try and understand a little bit more whether diet actually has any role in this kind of uh, microbial arms race. And that's important because, and I think we've seen that in multiple pictures uh, presented already today, particularly when we think about mammals, we're kind of going out into environments, but actually when you're looking at your reptiles or, or most of the amphibians, you're scaling all of that down. This is a wild environment and really actually it's a microhabitat. And what we're trying to do then is recreate that microhabitat um, uh, in Viveria and all factors of it, uh, including the, the environmental parts there, the substrate, the planting, the lighting, well, diet is a part of that also, um, and it could be influencing them. So essentially the, the thinking was, and, and I think we're starting to see this, uh, that cutaneous bacterial communities may be conferring protection against pathogens. Um, some of those pathways are starting to be elucidated. Um, and they're gained through interaction with other frogs, uh, but also through environmental transmission um, and through the diets they eat. And so whatever we do to care for them will have an impact on that composition. So what we were doing was using a simple swabbing technique, and even that was subject to a lot of scrutiny because it's a very small swab. But given that we were swabbing frogs for lots of reasons to check that they didn't have chytrid, that they didn't have other pathogens, um, when we were talking this through with our ethics committee, somebody made the point that that swab looks small, but in relation to a frog, it's like taking a big two by four and scraping it up and down your back. So we do have to think about what that's doing when we're handling our frogs for all these different purposes. Um, so we were really careful to use sterile gloves um, and change everything. Um, and we were swabbing 
we wanted to make sure that we were not cross-contaminating between uh, the animals and we were looking at the dorsal and the ventral regions of the frog uh, to swab them separately to just get as much coverage. Um, they'd be rinsed after, uh, on each, they were rinsed before um, we swabbed to get rid of any transient bacteria and then swabbed um, a couple of times. Um, and really we were trying to do this and we monitored them for two weeks after the swabbing had happened just to make sure that none of them were adversely affected. Um, and what we were doing was we had animals um, starting with Vicky's study. We took animals through different life stages um, and we were looking at all these other growth measures as well as the, the swabbing data. So we had um, animals on a controlled tadpole diet, one where we knew the carotenoid levels were low and one where we had uh, deliberately augmented the carotenoid levels. We then let those uh, different groups metamorphose um, and going forward we did away with the low carotenoid tampo diet so all of the um, post metamorphic frogs were either on a controlled diet with no added carotenoids or had some carotenoids added to their diet remembering that the carotenoids would be added through the crickets that they consumed. So the tadpole diet was like a little paste um, and then the adult diet was, uh, the carotenoids were in the crickets. Then, uh, so these, this is going over um, uh, a couple of years because then when those animals reached a breeding stage, they were um, set up in breeding uh, facilities and allowed to breed. Um, and we did a crossover, so now we had them all paired up, and if they had received an animal that had not received um, carotenoids was now getting it. And this allowed us to look at the effect of carotenoids at different life stages. The bottom line, males and females, both sexes that were fed carotenoids were redder. So those were the pictures that I showed you. Um, that left-hand side that um, had the carotenoids. Females fed carotenoids were bigger um, than those that did not get carotenoids and they were also more fecund. And by that I mean we had um, five, we ended up with five breeding pairs in each situation, five pairs with low or no carotenoids exposure and, um, and females, the only females that bred were the ones that were being fed carotenoids. So we were getting more, we were getting eggs and also the clutch sizes were larger than had previously been reported. I think in the study we did not have the capacity to take those eggs forward and hatch them because that would have really been the nice thing to do. But meanwhile, we were there looking at the using culture methods to compare the bacterial community. Again, carotenoid fed or enriched and carotenoid free. And so what we see here is that the carotenoid enriched handily, you have more diverse bacteria, diverse bacteria, and you have more of them. There we go. Um, than when you don't get carotenoids in your diet. Did I manage to confuse everybody there? Are you all on? <laughs> You're good. You're good. Okay. Thank you. So really what we were starting to see was that um, really the extension of this thought was maybe carotenoids could combat chytrid. By having carotenoids or exposure to carotenoids in your diet, then and I'm picking chytrid because that's the most potent pathogen that we're all focused on, but really it was about carotenoids uh, enhancing health. Um, and this is because bacterial species and diversity and abundance leads to a community that's generally more resistant to pathogen stress and environmental change. And even forgetting chytrid for a moment, although that's hard to do, we can't, although some people will, deny that we're living through extreme climate disruption. I'm not even going to call it change, it's just disruption, however you want to characterise that. So that means that these frogs who are living in microclimates are living in microclimates that are changing faster than they can evolve to adapt to. Um, so the more that they can have tools in their arsenal to, to cope with that, the better. 
So by offering a more diverse diet, a more complex diet, a diet that more adequately reflects what they're being fed in the wild, we increase the likelihood of those host individuals harboring bacteria that are going to confer protection. And um, we like to think that a high carotenoid diet may help with that. So it does matter if you do, and we've got some empirical data to support that. We think that multi-generational breeding is a, a good objective measure for success. And there's, the, again, I'm stating what I've already said, um, there's a need for models, more species. I will point out that most of this research, if you I really very specifically mentioned Rachel and Vicky's work because they're on Google Scholar, so you can go and hunt them down and find their research or register for ResearchGate. Really quickly, because I wanted to try and brush up on this, that work was kind of finishing up around 2013, 2014. Um, but all you have to do is put in amphibians and carotenoids, and there's increasingly lots of other work going on with all these other model species, including tree frogs in Costa Rica by Andrea Brenna-Soto, working with Dr. Alan Dierenfeld, who's somebody that Alan also knows. There's um, looking at carotenoids uh, in relation to warning signals um, in poison frogs, and then even looking at carotenoids as a health status in Japanese trees, tree frogs post Hiroshima, uh, post the, uh, the accident in Fukushima. And then um, there's evidence for this in other species where they go on and look at color change in this gorgeous yellow and black frog, uh, the Kororo, I'm not gonna pronounce that, because I'm, I'm not gonna follow for it. Corroboree, there we go, corroboree frog. Um, but there, that group is also doing some really interesting, cool stuff, looking at long-term dietary beta-carotene supplementation in sperm concentration and motility and larval growth. So then we go on and look at immunocompetence and uh, in other species here. So really, there's a huge amount going on. But I will come back to the fact, um, hopefully you know and love the purple frog or the snipe nosed frog or the Indian purple frog. Do we have some nods? Please, please have some nods. Please have some love. It's first described. 100 years ago, 1918, there's two species in the southern uh, western Ghats of India. There's 10 papers written about it because it was rediscovered, uh, one species in 2003 and one species in 2017. There's so much we don't know about amphibians. These ones happen to be purple, um, these ones happen to be another colour, um, but there's just a huge amount of knowledge that um, I, I can only do my job through the work that you do by documenting your herping, so thank you very much. Thank you guys for sticking around for that talk. I hope it was informative. I hope you learned a lot. Next week, we're going to be sitting down with former NFL player, co-founder and owner of Ship Your Reptiles, Chad Brown. Until then, you can watch Triple B TV. Y'all take care. Checking on the triplograph.